Jonathan Rose is a third-generation real estate developer and a visionary. 30 years ago, he began building affordable green housing projects before most people even imagined or ever heard of going green. Picture this, a cutting-edge dwelling that's filled with light, made with sustainable materials that conserve energy, features gardens on the roof, and includes a community health center, an organic food co-op, and a health club on the ground floor that's open to the entire neighborhood. This isn't a fantasy, but an affordable housing complex in the South Bronx. Now Rose is tackling mass transit. He was selected by the MTA to serve as their chairman of its sustainability commission in 2007. Rose led a team to devise plans to green and expand the public transportation system throughout New York City and its suburbs. Jonathan Rose joins us tonight to discuss his vision. Thanks so much for joining us, Jonathan. You're welcome. I'm you know, be to be here. Before we talk about mass transit, I want to talk a little bit about greening and affordable housing. I don't normally put those two phrases in the same sentence. Explain, explain the idea. Well, first of all, all buildings should be green. There is no reason why we build unhealthy or buildings that, buildings or buildings that consume too much energy in America today anywhere. One of the great things about affordable housing is that it has very limited budgets. And um, so if one can build affordable housing that's green, it means you can build any kind of building that's green. When you talk about sustainable buildings yes. in this environment, right, we're, we're, we're having a recession, right. unfortunately. Right. Does it make sense to be investing whatever else, and I assume there's an additional cost to make this work in this economy? Actually, this is an environment where we need to be really careful with every dollar we spend, and so it makes even more sense. We typically spend only 1% more of a total development cost to make a building greener, whether it's affordable housing or non-affordable housing. The paybacks we get on just energy savings themselves often are paying back in five, six, seven years. So if you're financing affordable housing with a 30-year mortgage and you're paying it back with seven over seven years, you're actually getting positive cash flow from day one just on the energy and water savings. But additionally, if we're creating non-toxic environments that are healthier, that are greener, you're lowering the health care cost to society for the residents who are living in these buildings. It's overall a win-win for the residents, for the owner of the building, and for society at large. Does the model work better in the city, or I'm assuming does it work better? I'm assuming right. it works better outside of the city where it's cheaper to build. It actually works better in the city for another reason. The typical uh, a lower income and working class person spends almost as much on transportation outside of the city as they do on their housing. So they'll spend about 30% of their income on housing and about 30% of their income getting to and from their job, their schools, their housing, etc. That's because they're using a car and they have not only gas and oil and tolls, but they have car payments. Um, and in some states, even taxes on the automobile. When somebody moves into a city and lives in a trans, uh, transit accessible location, they're only spending 9% of their income. So if you have a affordable housing or working class housing next to transit, you've actually increased the resident's income by 21%. It's an incredible difference. So affordable housing makes much more sense in urban places or next to transit than it does out in suburbia. You know, the stimulus package was just right. passed this week, $787 billion. Some of this money is supposed to go towards green collar jobs. Right. If you could take this money and create your dream project right. in New York City, yes. what would you do? There are 950,000 buildings in New York City, and I would green all those and employ hundreds of thousands. And what does of that mean to green all of them? So we can reduce the energy consumption of almost any existing building today by weather stripping, sometimes replacing windows, replacing boilers, better insulation, very simple, not only proven technologies, some of these are quite old technologies, some cases adding solar and more adventurous things, but most of it's very matter of fact material use and, and just what's called integrated design. And we can do this for 10, 20, $30,000 a unit, in some cases $25,000 a house and houses out in Queens and Brooklyn, et cetera. And this will be re could reduce our city's environmental impact tremendously. It would create jobs. And now think about it. That means probably 100 million windows. If we replace all those windows or use storm windows, instead of buying those from somewhere else, we can be manufacturing those windows right in New York City in our industrial areas. So it's a great opportunity to, not, to create environmental benefit, 
benefits, social benefit, job training, local economic development. You know, you, you, you give a great list there of good things, and right. then the question is, why aren't we doing more of it? Under the Bush administration, we really, there was a, a disinterest in investing in both our cities and investing in the environment. There was this belief that there was a conflict between environment and economy. What we've actually learned is there's a tremendous confluence between environment and, and economy. That environmental investments can be better for the economy, create jobs, be better for the environment at the same time. When you think about green collar jobs right. and you think about doing what you just described, right. how many jobs can you actually create? Um, shovel ready, as they say. I believe we need to design shovel ready jobs and pencil ready jobs. Right. And this is in New York City. So in New York City, right. um, my guess is uh, 100,000. America builds 1% of its building stock a year. 99% exists. So if we're really going to have a transformation, we have to green the existing buildings, but they're an amazing opportunity to employ people in the existing buildings. Now, when I say shovel ready, that's right people getting to work. Mm -hmm. When I say pencil ready, that's people getting ready to design. We have an amazing design talent in New York in architects and engineers and energy planners, etc. And they also need work and they're also the recession is also hurting them too. The next time we're looking for shovel ready projects, we need to have shovel ready projects designed. And we have tremendous infrastructure needs in New York City for rebuilding our bridges, for uh, transforming our streets. There's a tremendous amount that can be done to make our streets uh, better for pedestrians, for bicyclists, to receive stormwater, all kinds of great things that can be done. And we need to be employing the architects and engineers to preparing for the next funding. I want to move now towards right. public transportation. Right. You were on this uh, commission, this committee, yes. uh, to study the MTA, to, to come up with a plan. What did you find? So first of all, we found which uh, was that the MTA has 68,000 employees and a whole lot of them have great ideas. So partly what we did is we tapped into the ideas of the existing MTA employees. We also found they're doing a lot of great things. One of our goals was, for example, to reduce water use. And we discovered they're recycling rainwater and bus wash water. They're actually being very efficient in that. We found there are many areas where they're being very efficient. They're already rebulbing Grand Central and getting rid of all the uh, old incandescent bulbs and replacing with compact Really? Through, throughout all Grand Central? Throughout the whole station. But it's not just the station, it's the tunnels. Right. It's the, the, where there's a lot of light bulb. When you think about buses, yes. when you think about trains, right. you think about them being economically, uh, not economic, but environmentally viable because we get a lot of people on them. But yes. the energy it takes to move them still not... Can be reduced. So, can be reduced. So people who are riding mass transit are using about a quarter of the energy of people who are driving uh, single occupancy vehicles. As a matter of fact, if all of America's uh, uh, Americans traveled the way we travel in New York City, we would not have an energy problem. We'd be barely importing energy. Given the economic situation, right. given the reduction in budgets, right. are the types of things that you'd like to get done going to get done? They have to get done. And first of all, from a global competitiveness point of view, China is spending a trillion dollars on rail and infrastructure. Russia is spending a trillion dollars on rail and infrastructure. America is actually getting left behind. India is spending, um, I think, six or eight hundred billion dollars on rail and infrastructure. It is the wave of the future, and America will be a second-rate country if we don't do this. Connectivity, it turns out, and mass transportation, and by the way, airport transportation and uh, freight rail efficiency are all key necessary infrastructure elements to an economically competitive society. And that's what you mean by getting left behind. And so we will be le we will be less economically competitive if we don't make these investments. The great thing about these investments is they create a lot of jobs. And they not only create jobs, they leave you with something that creates quality of life and improves the environment. So it's a total win-win. So give me a little bit of future of New York. Right. Can we become a leader on the green front? So we already are a leader in the green front. Another thing, the mayor's plan NYC, plan 2030, mm -hmm. is the best green plan in America. It is a model. You know one of the great things about it, it's not only a great strategy for how to green the city, but it's very metric based. It's got measurables. The mayor says, I'm going to plant a million trees. And he's actually tracking every week how close is he to those million trees. And you can go on the website and see. So. It's, it's an integrated strategy. It's hitting on many, many fronts, and it's measurable. And um, it, by the way, it's not perfect. It'll be continually, but, but he recognizes that, and there's pathways for continual improvement. Thank you, Jonathan, for joining us. This was fascinating. Thank you so much for having me.